calling all creatives out there. I have a very special treat for you today. Today, we are talking to Nick Onken. He is a world-renowned photographer. He's going to share a little bit about his past and tell you all of the fabulous things he's done so far in his career. But today, we're focusing on how to turn your passion into a profit. And I couldn't think of a better person, a more creative person to bring to you today to share his story and how he did just that. Welcome, Nick. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So let's kind of dive right in. So you're in the middle of COVID. You're in the middle of maybe a lockdown and you're at your studio, your apartment in New York. What's that been like for a creative kind of putting you in a box? Are you traveling? Are you staying put? Oh, I've been all over the place. (laughs) Although I will say like I have curated and set up my apartment to be here. Uh, My normal life when I'm home is pretty much just like being quarantined because I sit here and I work for 13 hours a day. Um, so, you know, we'll get into that, but, um, but yeah, I mean, being here, I, you know, I think once things opened up around the end of May, uh, beginning of June and people started, you know, I think all the stuff that started coming out of the information, like a lot of people started feeling more okay to travel. And, um, I did, I, I think I took my first trip around August back out to LA and did a bunch of like a bunch of people booked shoots. And I just needed to get out. I just needed to get out and get on the road and and feel the freedom and feel the feel the na- get out in nature and and all of those things because it definitely helps my creative process to be experiencing new spaces and places and friends and all that. So I would think so. New input, new stimuli for you out there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, your story is a terrific story that really speaks to the person who's creative but doesn't really know how to turn their passion into a living. And when I met you, I thought, first of all, super cool guy. I love creatives. And then I looked at your work and I loved you even more. But you have kind of a a unique story in that it's one of persistence, but you didn't really give up on your passion. Can you kind of take us back to the early days, maybe in Seattle? Tell us a little bit about how your passion grew, how you identified it, and, and what were some of the thresholds that took you to the next level? Yeah, I mean, persistence is the is the key, and I think that's a big piece of the personality that um, you need to cultivate in order to create a long lasting um, profit and and just business in the arts. I think that's a huge piece of that. But for me, I started out as a graphic designer. That's what I went to school for, and I did that for about four or five years. And during that time, I picked up a digital camera to, to uh, shoot, uh, just like to shoot for my design work, you know, utilizes creative assets. And this is like a long time ago. So, you know, this is just when digital photography, like digital technology, digital cameras were just getting good enough in the point and shoot uh, space of things that you could actually use them, use the files digitally in design and, and whatnot. So... Once I picked that up, I just started shooting for fun and, you know, here and there, I'd shoot some friends or I'd shoot whatever, I'd shoot a cup on a table, you know, and then that just, I started really enjoying that a lot more. And then I ended up convincing a nonprofit design client of mine to split the expenses on a trip to Africa to build them a photo library. And mind you, I had no idea what I was doing at this point. I was just like, oh yeah, that sounds fun. I want to donate my time and and give back and also, you know, travel the world. (laughs) You had the courage to come up with the idea and actually say it out loud. So. Yeah. And then, you know, I just, you weave the parachute on the way down. So, you know, but you know, I think there's a, there's a really good space of like, don't bite off more than you can choose so that you can also accomplish accomplish it. But you know, this was this is within my wheelhouse that I I could do and figure out. And so I went to Zimbabwe, Uganda, Kenya and Burundi. And, um, and then I went to Europe after that, it was definitely a life changing trip in in two different ways. I think the big the first big one was just like my worldview. I've never been to the developing world before and being immersed in that space was a whole it's a culture shock. And, you know, it just opened my eyes to the way that other people live. And you know, you're talking about people that live in a in a you know, mud hut with grass roof, and they're sweeping the dirt every day off the floor. And, you know, to experience that for the first time was, you know, definitely humbling and shocking. And um, so that's always been a part of my ethos and business and giving back and and giving back to the world and, and donating, you know, my skills and things like that. And secondly, it opened my eyes to the world of photography. Uh, I, I still didn't really even know that it was actually a career. I didn't know that you could actually make a business out of it. Like I had no idea. So shortly thereafter, I got connected with a graphic designer or like with a, I actually got connected with a uh, 
photographer to do graphic design website updates for him. And this was kind of my opening, the door opening and the universe kind of like, here you go, here's a door. And so I started asking him all these questions about photography. And eventually he just invited me to come out on set and work with it or just like hang out. And I was like, cool. So I came out and, you know, started kind of you know, hanging out with him and his assistant here and there. And that really opened my eyes to what like the actual world of photography was as a business. And so he was really instrumental in, in helping me see that and see the possibilities of that. And that was kind of where I started to make the switch. But it's, it's a long journey, right? You know, like I think this is a big thing with making a career in the art is that you really got to build your craft. You have to refine your craft and like put that 10,000 hours in because like you're going to, it's going to take time before people actually want to pay you for your artwork. And that's, I think the big thing is when you want to turn it into a profit or even like a business, you have to keep grinding and you have to have a bridge job in the meantime, because you got to have a, a job that's going to pay your bills and, and sustain you while you're getting your craft good enough to be um, commercialized and for people to want to pay you for it. So uh, the more work that you turn out um, on a faster and faster uh, time frame, the uh, the faster you're going to get to that point. Uh, and for me, it, you know, it took a couple of years to where I was like getting little things here and there. And then one of my first big jobs was for Nike. And, uh, I, that was again, like another one of those, like just a bit step above step out for me, uh, to where I'd never done anything like this before. And we were shooting pro sports players, uh, throughout like five different cities. And, you know, a, it was like the amazing race. We were like traveling, you know, every day to a different city to the point where you and we were shooting like Brian Urlacher and Albert Pujols and Mario and Rivera and Brian Urlacher and all these other guys. I have no idea who they were. I had to like Google them. But however, <laughs> for those of you that do know the sports world, you'll know who they are. Um, so I was thrown into it. Another another time I was, I was thrown into like the the mix of having to figure it out because we had to, we had to like construct a studio, like a photo studio on the side of the commercial TV set, the the broadcast production. And like the, the athletes would go and film their their TV spot and they would come over to us to create the digital assets and 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 the uh, still photos. Luckily I found, you know, I found an assistant and he set every he helped me set everything up. And then, you know, he brought all the gear with us and we traveled all these different cities and uh, it was an amazing time. And you know, I thought, okay, I'm in like this is this is it. I, I just did Nike. I'm like, I'm, I'm rolling. I got the ball rolling on the commercial side of things. And uh, I didn't see a job like that for two years. And so, you know, it's not always going to be this like straight shot. Once you feel like you've hit the big leads, you know, your business is always going to be up and down and up and down. And you got to keep hustling through all of that stuff. And you've got to be, you know, tenacious and persistent and keep developing your work. Um, you know, I think there's, you know, I've been, I've, I've been of this staying of, um, you know, make better pictures or make better art and show more people. So as an artist, you got to constantly be bettering your craft and building your craft and refining it and refining it and refining it and then refining your portfolio. And then also getting it in front of more people, showing more people so that like the opportunities that arise and people want to pay you for it eventually you'll get there. So, you know, on, onward and upward i uh, i spent a lot more time developing my portfolio and then a couple of years later i got another job for nike and then it kind of started the ball rolling a little bit and then a couple of years after that i got an agent that helped me um just really launched me into the commercial business of things and so i was doing campaigns for everyone from nike reebok coca-cola um walmart chevy like all these big brands which was really really amazing and then i kind of got I had like a few good years and then the industry shifted a little bit. I got a little burnt out. And so then my business started going downhill a little bit. And I had to navigate that with like the rise of social media and Instagram where like it almost be, has become more about the platform than the actual quality of the work. So that shifted the industry a lot as well. And then, yeah, further down the road, I, saw, I did an emotional intelligence leadership training uh, with my friend Lewis Howes and uh, that he got me into and, that really kind of helped give me a new framework of, of life and thought and, and outlook, which also turned into my podcast, uh, which I launched. And then I started playing around with different mediums, painting and, and hand-drawn typography. 
And then that extended into a few years ago, I started making hats as, you know, it's just like another canvas for what I've been doing. So now I'm in a space where I'm doing a lot more personal branding for entrepreneurs in the photography space. So helping people elevate their visual brands, um, because now is the time now is the, uh, the rise of the personal brand and everybody's, you know, people starting new businesses and, and when you're selling yourself as a product, like that is a huge, you have to have elevated photography to create that. So that's a majority of what I'm doing in the photography space now. And then just really, you know, how, am I, you know, the next thing for me is really scaling things and bringing everything under one roof, under one umbrella, under one mission. So that's why I call myself a creative alchemist is it is, it's really about creating a consistent brand so that everything that I put out underneath it has consistency. It feels the same. It has the same message. And, you know, I think for me, the ultimate message is to really inspire and um, inspire people to like go within and find their, their highest selves. And maybe that's creativity. I think it's always creativity, whether you're an actual artist or an entrepreneur, because if you're an entrepreneur, your, your business is your art. Right. And, you know, so you're creating something from nothing and, and we're all creators. And I, and I believe that uh, everyone can unleash that. That's true. That's true. So amazing rise, rise and fall. I understand that you didn't give up. So when you said that you had that great job with Nike and it was terrific and you thought, okay, I'm set, I'm on my way, I'm launched. And then there was not a huge job after that for two years. It was a break. Mentally, that has to do something to your psyche. And what did it do? And then how did you tell yourself it's not over? Don't quit. Don't quit. Um, you know, to be honest, like that, that first one was just like, oh, I was just, just still on the rise. Like I hadn't really felt like I had made it. And so for me, it was just a matter of like, okay, I just got to keep going. I got to keep developing my portfolio. It's not as good. Right. So if it's not garnering the results and the jobs, then I got to make it better. So I think that was in my, um, in the rise of my career. And it wasn't until like, I really developed like a, a lot of income doing this in the commercial world. And then that started going downhill. That's where I just spiraled emotionally because I was so attached to my self-worth was so attached to my art Mm -hmm. and like who I was shooting, what I was shooting for all these different things that I didn't, and I didn't realize it. I was not aware of this, you know, and, and it's easy to not, to not be able to be aware of it because as an artist, you get so immersed in the work that you're creating and who you're creating with and all these different things. And if that goes away, you know, which it did, it started to slow down and I kept losing all these jobs. And I was like in a complete mental downward spiral. <clears throat> and trying to figure out how to navigate that. And that's like when I started doing that, I did that emotional intelligence and leadership training and that helped pull me out of the, that mental spiral um, and keep going, you know? And, and at that point, even, even as going downhill as it was, what kept me motivated and kept me persistent, it was like, A, the taste of the life of freedom, of being able to do what you love, even though it's, you may not, you may be at, at empty a zero or crashed, it was still much better than actually, you know, the idea of going back and having a, a regular job, like I wouldn't trade it. And so that, and, and I just love the craft. I loved, um, I love photography and I love creating. So I think the mix of those three things is what has really given me the persistence to keep going and to keep creating. And even through this last year, it's like another round of that, right? Because of COVID and all these different things, you always got to constantly be pivoting and, and up leveling and creating and creating new things and new products. And I mean, it's a kind of a free for all now uh, in this day and age of, of trying to navigate this whole existence of, you know, art and commerce and art and commerce. So you always have to have the art, you know, you have to focus on the art while creating commerce somehow, uh, whether it's a bridge job or, you know, the actual work that you love, that you love to do. So one thing that I've noticed about uh, speaking with many artists in all different areas is that it's one thing to be an artist and be very creative and just say, I've got a feeling everybody, whether it's a shoot or it's a painting or whatever it is, everybody just cooperate, go with me, humor me until we get this shot. And then you'll see, you'll, you'll see it's something fabulous. There's another thing when you finish the day and you say, my calendar has three weeks open, I need to now put on my business hat and I need to go sell myself. And a lot of artists that I've met are uncomfortable 
in that role because it's not what comes naturally to them, but it's a necessary evil. How did you kind of fit that in? Was it a problem for you or did you have a mentor? Was it a natural? How did you fit that in before you got someone to help sell you for you like an agent? I mean, I've been in all kinds of different spaces, but when I was first starting, I hired consultants to help me develop marketing plans. And in in the commercial industry, there's a, there was a specific way of doing it. There was a way to like contact, you know, get by con access to contacts, con, you know, send direct mail of campaigns, do print campaigns, email campaigns, all these different things to the people that hire artists, uh, designers, and illustrators and photographers. Um, you know, the industry has definitely shifted since then and that still exists, but it's just like so much harder to break through the walls. However, when I started, I was, I just hit the road hustling, you know, my, these consultants helped me curate my portfolios. They gave me, helped me create a game plan to market and get out there. Uh, so, I mean, I definitely would recommend hiring people that can help you. Um, you know, everybody has a different budget, but it's worth saving up for, and, and utilizing. And I still use consultants today for different aspects of my business, because for me, it's really how can I delegate as much as possible. And when you don't have enough money to delegate, you know, you just have to like bite the bullet and do it for yourself. Because um, you're, you're working going to get out there unless you do something about it. So um, it is really about just hunkering down and doing some of that dirty work uh, until you can find somebody to do that. Having an agent was definitely a huge help, but it even still, I still had to do a lot of my own relationship building and marketing and and things like that. So it's not like you get an agent and you don't have to do any of it anymore. No, that's like kind of not even the case. You got to keep going. You got to keep like doing the same stuff. And it's just like an amplifier to have them. So, you know, I mean, I'm working on that too. And the business, the personal branding business for me is a completely different business model. And it's it's not the traditional business model that I used to work for. So I, I don't have an agent anymore. Um, I don't even really do much commercial stuff unless it's a brand I really, really love. Uh, because for me, like the same amount of money that used to be there isn't necessarily there now, or you have to work 10 times harder to find it. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, I'm learning to work smarter, not harder. And that's right. the that's for me, like the next the next iteration of where this is all going. That's right. What aspect of your life now, because you've created that freedom and your lifestyle, you're in the driver's seat. What aspect would you go down with a ship for? I'm not giving up this, no matter how sparse the jobs get, which I know is not the case for you. What is the one thing that I'm never giving up out of your new lifestyle? The one thing? Um my freedom, freedom. <laughs> my freedom to be my own boss and do whatever I want. You know, like I could not, I would die a slow death if I had to go work for someone. You're not the cubicle kind of guy. No, actually it wouldn't be a slow death. It would be a very fast one. It would not last that long. <laughs> very funny. Very funny. Now, did you have a, a mentor when you were early on or even growing up that encouraged you in photography or is this all self-driven? Um, I mean, most of it was self-driven. I've definitely had some 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 mentors like that photographer that I told you about in Seattle that I first was working for. He was definitely a mentor that opened my eyes to the world of photography. And then I've had other, you know, I've had other kind of mentors here and there um, that were, you know, a little touch and go. And, um, you know, when you see him, you see him. And then a lot of it was just kind of reverse engineering some of my favorite photographers' work and and learning how to construct imagery that was of that stat of that like level um myself but that took a lot of practice a lot of practice and you keep because there's this oh there's always a gap between what you envision and what you produce mm -hmm. and the whole process is to close that gap is to be able to end up producing what you see uh but that's it. that's that's the whole that's part of the uh the journey and refining the craft is is closing that gap What's the best part about being on a set of any kind for you? What do you enjoy the most about that? Um, it's fun. I mean, it's so much fun having all kinds of, you know, you have a whole creative team. I have, I'll have like three assistants, a digital tech. And so all I have to pay attention to really is my relationship with the art director and the creative director. 
And then, you know, I have a whole team who will light for me. So I'll say like, I want this lighting. Well, we're going to set this up like this. And then the whole team goes and does that because my mental capacity is all has to go towards the art director and creating with him. So, you know, you have to kind of be able to not have to think about the technical stuff as much Mm -hmm. uh, because those big commercial sets are full on and it's a lot of brain space that takes away from the creative space um, on the technical side uh, to, to work with the creative directors, but it's so much fun. I mean, you get to go to cool locations. You have a whole team, you know, if I want, if I want a drink or, or a tea or something like somebody will run to Starbucks and go get it or whatever it is. It's, it's a lot of fun, you know, and, and just, you have like a creative camaraderie uh, there that's uh, that you have synergy with people and, I usually only really hire people that I like to work with, that I like their personalities and, and also that like understand and have the technical experience. So that also makes it more fun is having people that you like on set. Was it when you got to that certain point where you can hire assistants, you can hire people to do a lot of this work for you. Was it tough for you to let go of the reins and delegate and trust that they would do their job? Did, did that take some time to get used to that? Um, no, because I always hired people that, I, that were better than, than me at what it is, especially assistants. Cause there was a lot of times when I first started shooting commercial jobs that I was like, I had built my portfolio on natural light, you know? So it's just me and a camera, but you know, when you get into these commercial situations where you have to create imagery all day, no matter what, t- what kind of light it is, you have to get into modifying light and you have to get into artificial light and you have to like do all these different things. And I didn't know that world that much. So I hired assistants that were better than me on that technical side of that um, to come in and, and help me build what I needed. So, you know, I think that is a space where it's like, okay, now that I have the budget in that one specific job, I can hire out what I need. And I, and I learned a lot from watching my assistants build light, right? Sure. And, and so, yeah, my, my view is to hire people that are way better at whatever job it is obviously um there there's a whole team stylist makeup hair not that i do any of that stuff so it really is you're building a team that makes such a great a bigger value for the client well let's talk a little bit about the business side of the billing i'm sure that you learned okay here's the rate that i'm worth here's the rate that i'm i'm i won't take um this is what my time is worth but that must have taken some time for you to even handle the mechanics of the billing and then accounts receivable, accounts payable. Did someone else do that for you? Did you start off doing that by yourself, an easy program? What was that like to step into that world? Um, I always done it myself and I still do it. When I had a rep, they were billing the client, um, but I still had to bill them and I still had to, you know, the reps and the the agents, they, okay, I'll take that back. The the reps in that space will, you know, they were the ones that were negotiating the pricing. They would, but we'd have to get estimates from say like a producer. And then we'd add my fees on top of that, you know, which the agent would do. Um, but I've done it so much enough that I can just do that myself. And this is where it's all changed a lot too, is that the clients are now more dictating what the rates are, at least what I've seen. And so it's, it's, uh, there's less control over that necessarily. Like you can still, f- um, push people up a little bit here and there and negotiate. Uh, when I first started, it was really kind of like talking to other photographers and getting advice and, and asking what I should. It's not my favorite thing to do, (laughs) but you got to do it. Another one of those things where you got to bite the bullet and do it. Um, But I always like to kind of be in control of the finances and and see where things are going um, and see when things are coming in. And as a photographer, you're making bigger chunks of money and less, less bigger chunks, I'd say. So it's not as hard to manage all these like little transactions. It's what like just like less frequent, big transactions. So I've always done it myself, um, you know, in different endeavors, I will probably hire and hire as much of it out as I can in like future endeavors. So did, did it take you some time to um, learn the mechanics of accounting or was it a natural for you? Because I think some people would shy away from that part thinking, no way, I'm not an accountant. The numbers aren't my thing. I'm going to mess this up. Um, what was that like for you? Um, so I was doing it all myself for a long time. And up until like, even I would, I would have an accountant do my taxes and things like that. 
Um, but I would manage all the the day to day. You know, for me, it was really just as a small business, a single person. I would just have like for me, one of the secrets I I use is like putting everything on credit cards and having separate credit cards for business for personal. That way, everything's funneling into like your statement. So everything that's business related, business expense, you goes on one credit card. Right. And then um, I would just go through all. I'd sit down, watch movies, and go through all those at the end of the year and just like you know, categories, everything for the accountant and pull in all the receipts and everything. Uh, now a lot of stuff is like very much digitized, obviously. So it's a lot easier to do that stuff. Now I have accountants that just reconcile the books and, and do all that stuff um, for me in terms of like the expenses. Right. Of things. right. But another, yet another thing that's like, I want, I, I have the finances to delegate that out now. Right. So I can hire other people to do it. Right. Well, one of the things that I tell people is if you're not really good at something, you know, go take a quick class. Everything can be, you can find anything online. You don't have to physically go in a class and you can find out just the basics if you need the structure and then take it from there and learn and go figure out what you need to do if you don't have the money to hire somebody. Absolutely. So I'm going to take you back to that first job with Nike again. Mm -hmm. Thoughts. When you got that call, uh, I believe you hadn't done a lot of work in studio at that point. Am I accurate in saying that? Um, I haven't done a lot. I I had just like started using artificial light before that um, and playing around with it, but I still didn't really know what I was doing. So, yeah. Okay. So let's go to the feeling of that. How did you keep from hyperventilating from excitement and from sheer terror that you might screw it up? Did you worry about that and what was going through your mind and how did you make it through that? So you didn't screw up and you enjoyed it and you did a good job, obviously. Yeah. I mean, it's just a matter of knowing that you're going to do everything you can to figure it out. So for me, I was like, how do I figure that out? Well, I asked people that have done it before. So randomly I connected with a producer that a producer friend of mine who used to produce for Nordstrom's and stuff like that. And she was like, Oh, just call my friend Brandon. He's an assistant. He's got all the lighting. He's down in LA. He can probably just drive it down to San Diego and all that stuff. So I did, got connected with him. And he's like, Yeah, I can set it all up for you. He's like, I can even drive down the equipment and you know, I can you can pay me to go pay me to assist as well. And then I was like, Well, what about how do I, I was like, because I was trying to figure out how to get gear to like Pittsburgh and St. Louis and all these other places that are like super obscure where it's really hard to find any gear. And then you have to have like huge, like you have to have credit cards and like down payments and insurance to even rent the gear and stuff like that, you know, navigating that stuff. And then he was just like, Oh yeah, I can just fly with the gear too, if you want me to. And I was like, sweet. <laughs> so that's how it happened. And then he just set it all up for me. We get to set and I just, we just had some reference images and I was like, I need to do this. And he was like, great. And then we just dial it in, we dial it in with test shots. And then, you know, we got it dialed in. So again, it's so much about finding the team to do it, hiring the right people that you know that have done it before, that do it better than you, you know, and a lot of times they call them lighting technicians is like the first assistance um, kind of title, uh, especially when once you get up into like the bigger, the bigger jobs and stuff like that, you know, lighting technicians uh, will come in and help you light things the way that you want it. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the trick. Ask people that are, that have done it before, find referrals that, from people that you trust. Um, and usually if you have something coming down the pipeline, like I've, people are pretty kind to answer. I've done that for other photographers to like give advice or give, like give show, you know, show them where they can find stuff to complete a job and things like that. So looking back to your younger self, what do you, what advice would you give someone else saying, what do you wish you would have wasted less time on? Cause it really doesn't matter at this point. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think a lot of it maybe was just like spending less time in my graphic design career, you know, like letting that go earlier um, and like starting photographer earlier, maybe. Uh, and then, you know, let go of, uh, I think just like, stay steady, stay patient, because like, I wanted it so bad. I wanted to be a commercial photographer so bad. And I was like, when is this going to come? When is this going to come? And like, you just got to like, it took five years to like really get things blowing at least. If you look at five years, break it down, it's roughly 10,000 hours. And, you know, for me, it was roughly 10,000 hours. And like how much of that is actually practicing the craft, how much of his business, 
but you know i think you just got to keep grinding and keep keep grinding and keep getting better and like be patient and know that like your hard work will be rewarded um and that was the hard part for me to like almost suffer through <laughs> right but you had to pay your dues in a way right so you've done Abs- absolutely absolutely done that so you kind of answered it in that question but what now to your younger self what do you wish you would have spent more time on looking back um spent more time on honestly like i think personal development okay. and emotional navigation uh because that is i mean as an entrepreneur of anything you know your your emotions and your beliefs and your limiting beliefs and your possible belief in possibility what dictates what you are actually capable of and you can if if you can learn how to break and reprogram and reshift and shift a lot of those program beliefs you can create a bigger expanse of whatever it is that you're building do you really feel like the sky's a limit for you i do i do yeah now it's just a matter of like what do i actually want to dedicate my or like funnel my time into Right. If you had a dream shoot with maybe a dream client or clients, maybe it's a subject or it's a project, you say, oh, my life would be complete if I could just do this someday. Have you ever thought about that? (laughs) Uh, I don't know if anything will ever make my life complete. However, I would love to, I would love to make a hat photograph and photograph Pharrell and interview him. That would be amazing. Nice. I love his vibe, his creative and and kind of uh, spiritual practice and ethos. I think he would be fun to collaborate with. Okay. Well, I see the word intention over your shoulders. So you put that intention out in the world and we'll tune back in and see when you actually photograph him. You're exactly. Probably- but I do want to do a coffee table book. That's like huge on the list for me is to to check that off. I've done a book, a photography book, travel photography book years ago, but I want to do like an art coffee table book that is definitely on the table for me. That's on the table. So tell some of the listeners that aren't familiar with your work, you've got some terrific people that you that are named, known and unknown. Can you share just a few people who you've shot that you had a lot of fun uh, on set with? Yeah. I mean, let's see who has been super fun. Uh, I mean, Bieber was fun in certain ways. <laughs> He's sometimes a little awkward <laughs> to interact with, but I've had some fun shooting him. I shot him at his house one time. Um, and that was, you know, that was fun. Cause he was like free to do whatever we wanted to do. We just shot him on a skateboard. We shot him jumping on a trampoline, shot him like, uh, and what was he doing? Oh, we just shot him in this crazy $60,000 a month house that looked like a spaceship. That was pretty cool. <laughs> um, yeah. And then I shot him and Cody Simpson for an album cover, uh, which never saw the light of day because they killed the album right after we shot. Okay. <laughs> uh, but that was fun because I got to shoot film. Uh, we got to run around this huge ranch in Topanga and, and Malibu and um, uh, somewhere in that area in California. And you know, I, I photographed Tony Robbins on his jet uh, with Lewis. That was a lot of fun. Uh, such a nice guy. He's like, felt like he knew him forever. Okay. And then, yeah, Usher has been a lot of fun. I've traveled with him and hung out with him quite a bit. And, um, you know, he he's always, he's just got like a great energy to him. So those are some fun people. Lewis is always fun to shoot with. We've, we've traveled a lot together. We shoot, um, we shot in Turkey last year, which was a blast. Um, Istanbul and Cappadocia, Cappadocia, Cappadocia. What was that like? Um, the Cappadocia or shooting with him? Well, shooting with him, but in Turkey. Uh, it was awesome. Like it was, I mean, I'd never been to Turkey before and that was kind of on my bucket list. And I pitched him the idea cause we, you know, we were like in building a brand. It's like, what story are you telling? So we developed the idea of, you know, rising to your greatness and shooting amongst the hot air balloons in the mornings. And, you know, or shooting him like with all the hot air balloons in the background and all that stuff. So, I mean, it was, it's pretty full on because we were, had, we had to get up at like three in the morning to, to make the hot air balloons every day for like three days in a row. So we were just like dead, but like Cappadocia is beautiful. And uh, we shot in Istanbul the day before we had hired this um, guide to take us around and show us like all the cool spots to shoot at in, in Istanbul. And then we rented a helicopter and shot him on the tarmac with the helicopter. And we shot out, oh, we took a helicopter tour around 
around Istanbul. We shot in the helicopter and then we shot, um, where else did we shoot? Those are kind of the highlights. It was just like, you know, getting to do epic big stuff like that. We, we did a shoot, him and I did a shoot in Iceland like five years ago. And that was a lot of fun too. We like flew into Iceland. We rented helicopters and like these off-road vehicles and like trekked through the, the, the wilderness and <laughs> shot him in these like moon landscape looking places. So uh, those are always a lot of fun. And especially because Lewis is just a friend of mine. So we just like, you know, we get to hang out and shoot for like five days in epic locations and have like epic journeys together. So, <laughs> so you really have created the freedom in the life that you have dreamt of. Is it bigger than you ever thought it would be so far? Yeah. I mean, I never even, I never had a clue I'd ever be a photographer. I never had a clue I would be doing any of this stuff, but photography has opened the gateway to like so many different people and locations. I've been on seven continents and over 60 countries and mostly because of photography and, you know, mostly other people pay me to go there too. So that's the other beauty of it. You know, sometimes I, I pay to go there or or whatever, you know, I did a 10 day trip, 12 day trip to Tibet and with a friend of mine, and we just photographed Tibetan pilgrims and did a personal project out there. So that was beautiful in and of itself. Um, but yeah, it's really, it really is what you create it to be. And in photography, like you can create your portfolio to kind of take you to the, the places that you want, but you have to build it first, you know? Very nice. Very nice. Well, I would say you've done a fantastic job from nothing and an idea. You jumped and you moved to New York, the most expensive city in the U.S. Was that scary? <laughs> uh, yeah, but it wasn't. I didn't move to New York until after my career started taking off till I could afford it. So, like, I haven't had, I've been in the same apartment for, since I've moved here 11 years ago. But still, uh, I mean, that's whole next level. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, I, I'm totally grateful for it. I just, like, I didn't have, you know, I moved here at a higher space in my career. And, and it has been, you know, it's like, I think the harder thing is, is maintaining your level of lifestyle once you've created it. So, you know, when I was, when I got that first job for Nike, I barely had anything. And I just moved to, I just jumped off. I moved to Paris for half a year and, you know, I was living off of like maybe a thousand dollars a month expenses, you know, now it's like exponentially that. Um, and so like when the jobs aren't coming in, it's, it's a whole nother hustle of keeping up the lifestyle and like, paying these bills now. So, and even this year, like when COVID happened, all my jobs got canceled. I, I, I even collected unemployment this year because like, I didn't know if I was ever going to work again. Right. So, you know, it, it really is, you got to stay persistent. And I'm like, even at that point, I was like, I'm going to come up with a new business if I have to, if I have to do so, if I can, if I'll never be able to take photos again because of this Corona stuff, I'll, I'll, find something else. I'll, I'll build a business online. I'll do something. I'll never go to work for somebody again. Because you've had the taste of freedom. So you love it. So you're a survivor because there's a lot of people that dream and wish and complain, but they're not really doers. So you're definitely a doer. You put your money where your mouth is and you take action and you can't stop taking action until you get what you want. Absolutely. And you've got to be okay. You know, I think you've got to be okay with uncertainty because that level of uncertainty when you're running your own business is way higher. If you want security and you you can't, you have to have the security of, of um, a job and a, a consistent paycheck, it might not be for you right? because <laughs> there is a lot of emotional, there's a lot of alchemy that has to happen in navigating those emotions of uncertainty of never not knowing when the next job's going to come in, not knowing if you're going to be able to pay your bills at a certain point, things like that. Um, so there is that aspect of it, I would say. Is there a country that you really want to film in, take a, have a photo shoot in with somebody that you haven't visited yet? Um, I want to go to the Faroe Islands actually. Okay. Yeah. I've seen oh. photos and it looks epically amazing, but I haven't been there. All right. Well, to be, you can't do everything. I mean, you still have a lot of time left. True, true, true. Best piece of advice you ever got about anything that you've carried with you through life? Um, best piece of advice is you are not your thoughts. You are not your thoughts. How has that helped you? Well, if you believe that you are every thought that you have, and a lot of if, you know, if you're thinking you know, 80 to a hundred thousand thoughts a day. And most of those are negative. Where does that take you? Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to create new thoughts that lead you into life of possibility and a lot of life of, of, 
you know, love and freedom, you know, your, your, your own cage is your mental cage and your own limitations is your own mental limitations. Very true. Very true. Well, Nick, what is coming next for you? I know we're not out of this pandemic yet. What do you think is around the corner, maybe next year or in the coming year? Um, well, I am building out a couple things, photography business wise for entrepreneurs. I'm coming out with like a new consigliere reputation program, um, and, and really focusing on, on building out people's brands. So there's that aspect. Uh, my hat business is growing. I'm looking at taking that to a bigger, uh, more scalable space. And then I'm probably working on an online course around personal branding. Um, and then a book, and uh, probably some other things that are, this is like so many projects. I'm like, oh, I like this one. I like this one. I like this one. So, And you can do them all because you're doing them all now. So it's terrific. Well, where can people find you if they're excited, they want to follow you and witness the, the wonderful photography? It really is wonderful photography. Um, where can they find you? Thank you. I mean, my main point is Instagram at Nick Onken, N-I-C-K-O-N-K-E-N. You can get to everything from there, but photography specifically, I have a photography Instagram that's photographed by Nick Onken and then photographed by Nick Onken.com is my commercial uh, photography website. So you can see a lot of the commercial stuff I shoot there and then the hats are around there too. You'll find everything at Instagram though. So the hats are very cool. I hope to have one of those someday. They're very cool. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing a little bit of your life history with us and I can't wait to follow you through the next year to see what else you produce. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Perfect. Thank you.